well, welcome to Prescott Talks, the Prescott E! News is Prescott Talks. And I got to tell you, I'm a little bit excited about that entryway. You know, our producer camera guy, Rob Melligan, put together that intro to the show. And uh, I couldn't be happier. I was like, I was blown away all the technology. You know, I'm, I'm hard on a cell phone, much less any of that exactly. stuff. So I just want to thank Rob for putting that together. And, um, and, and, and basically, you know, he's very talented. I tell everybody on the show, he can either make you look really good or really bad. So I like to keep him on my good side. But anyway, thank you, Rob, for that. And again, welcome to Prescott Talks. Um, at any time while we're on the air right now, uh, and we're live streaming, you can make a comment or make a, uh, ask a question to my guest. And my guest today is Wiley Klein. And Mr. Klein is running for the Board of Supervisors District 2. And that is being, t right now is Tom Thurman's district. Yes, sir. And Tom D Thurman is no longer, go is not running for the next term. He's gonna retire, yes. So uh, you have stepped up and you, I assume you've got all your signatures in now or? We turn them in next month. You turn them in next yes. month. So for the folks that are watching today, and you know, I met you at the Highway 69 Republican Conservative meeting, which is really cool. If you're a conservative, I would definitely check that out. Absolutely. But you know, uh, uh, Wiley, why don't you speak to who are you and uh, why are you running? Uh, I'm Wiley Klein. I'm a fourth generation native of Gila County. So I'm from Arizona. Mm -hmm. Lived in the Verde Valley 18 years, 19 years. And the reason I'm running is because I've been watching our Board of Supervisors just waste money mm -hmm. all the time on things that we don't need, like uh, the Verde Connect. You've heard about that road project? Mm -hmm. I'm not for that. I think we need to take our money and put it in our existing road systems, mm -hmm. upgrade what we have before we start basically building more problems. When they build <clears throat> roads like that, uh that I understand that's like a million dollars a mile, something like that. Uh, It'd be probably rate. that, if not more. Not more. It's the bridge itself. They have a twenty-five million dollar federal grant for, mm -hmm. but it's attached to where they have to spend money other places to get that grant. Gotcha. And then it's probably I don't know how many miles across there, but it'd be ten plus million dollars easy to build the road mm -hmm. to connect two roads that really don't need connected. Gotcha. And. So I told my wife, I said, you know, I can either sit at home and complain mm -hmm. or get off my butt and, and do something. Do something. Exactly. So yeah. I chose the latter. Right. <laughs> get off my butt and run for Board of Supervisors. Well, backing <laughs> up just a little bit on that now, you were in law enforcement for how many years? Yes, sir. 12. 12 years? I took years. an early retirement. And you, were, and you served for what municipality was that? I was with Gila County Sheriff's Office and Payson PD. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> okay. And you're, you, you are currently working right now at another job? Yes, I currently? work for ADOT right now. ADOT. Yes. So in the event that you are elected to the board, would you continue serving for no, ADOT? Or I'd, would you go I'd to resign. resign? You'd resign yes. and go for uh, a full-time board of supervisors? Because, yeah. you know... It's not a full-time position. You can make it a full-time position, right? It will be a full-time position for me because if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, mm -hmm. my goal is at least on either Monday or Friday, depending on my schedule, is to be somewhere in the communities yes. meeting people right? every week. Yeah. I mean, they will get to know me. One of the things, I live in District 5, okay. so... One of the things I really enjoyed was coffee with Jack. You know, Jack Smith mm -hmm. used to have that coffee chat. I, I think that is so effective um, to get with the community and find out what's going on in the heartbeat. Sometimes there were a few people showed up. Other times there was large groups. But what a great way to be accessible to your constituents. Uh, uh, you your, have to be. You know, uh, you, you and find out. You can't do it without the people's help. Right. You have to have... Every citizen in the county, not just my district, but everybody has to have input on what's going on. It's not just up to five people what happens. Well, that also that you're representing in their desires and wishes, right? Absolutely. So um, it's important to find out what their desires and wishes are, right? And if, if and, you're going to represent the best them, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and, that's pretty basic stuff right there. And I make sure. I mean, I give my phone number out right now. Yeah, go ahead. If pe it's it's right here on my pamphlet. It's 
Either my wife will answer or I will. And, you know, uh, you do have a website. Rob's putting that up right now. Thank so you, So you have, uh, uh, you can click right, go to your website. Do you have a Facebook page? I do. It's uh, Wiley Klein for District 2 Supervisor. Okay. Wiley Klein for District 2 Supervisor. Yes. So if you have a question for Mr. Klein, you can certainly do that via Facebook. Absolutely. You know, the neat thing about modern technology, man, it's easy to get a hold of these folks. You know, it's just... Um, uh, and, and and be honest with you, when I get a hold of a candidate, they often return my 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 comment. Um, you know, I made a comment to my supervisor yesterday, Mary mm -hmm. Mallory, and lo and behold, this morning when I got up on, on my uh, computer, there was her reply. Thank you for your comment. So you know, um, they do listen. I, they I, do. I do believe that, and I and I believe the I believe the whole board listened very. Uh, content, uh, loudly when the people came to uh, Fair Street and talked about the Second Amendment and becoming a sanctuary city. Oh, they absolutely sanctuary. did, yes. And I want to make sure I clarify that. A Second Amendment sanctuary city. Because I get still get comments going, why <coughs> would you want to be a sanctuary city? It has nothing to do with immigration, <laughs> folks. We're talking about the Second Amendment in our Constitution. And uh, one of the questions I want to ask you, Wiley, and I'm asking this with all, all the candidates that are running. You know, as a police officer, as a sheriff, you mm -hmm. swore an oath. Absolutely. And you, put, and you swore an oath that you would protect and defend the Constitution. Absolutely. And as I see sometimes people, as we, as we observe, I should say, not everybody has the same meaning when they said, I will preserve and defend the Constitution. How far would you be willing to do that? In other words, and when I say that, and I want to specify, I've heard, well, we can't do this because we may wind up uh, losing funds, or the lawyers say we can't do this because it would be, you know, not best for uh, getting our monies back from the lottery or what have you. But my, my saying is my, my constitutional rights are never for sale. That's me. I want to know where you're at. I have the same feeling. Okay. I mean, that's what governs everything in this country is our Constitution. And you can't just set it aside. All right. I mean, that's what this country was founded on. So, yeah, I'm 100% behind the Constitution. I'm not going to trade my beliefs for that for federal dollars, state dollars, any kind of money. It just, it's not going to happen. Well, I appreciate that because I think that's really important going forward, knowing where our candidates stand oh, when, it comes to, when it comes to, you know, we can all sit and recite words. Oh, yeah. But then there's time when, like I say, the rubber hits the road and we may have to, you know, make a statement and say, no, we're not going to do something that's going to violate a constitutional law or a constitutional right. And if that means, you know, not getting state money or our road fixed or something like that, we will stand strong and we'll fight you in the courts in order to do it. Absolutely, and figure out another way to do and it. And figure out another way. You know, actually be fiscally responsible for once. Yeah. Set aside money for 10 years, however yeah. you can do it. Well, it's interesting, <coughs> you, you know, um, you, segueing into like PSPRS. Um, we see a lot of money that's going into a system that is, you know, financially and uh, uh, broken. They're not getting their returns. We're paying out more than what uh, um, we're paying out more than what's what's coming in. So, what would your answer be to that? Um, As a recipient of one of them checks, because mm -hmm. I, that's what I retired out of. <laughs> that should hit home pretty close, right? I yeah. love that system, but yeah, it's severely broken because of the administrator we had. Just absolutely invested horribly. Mm -hmm. Lost, I want to say, somewhere around $6 billion. It was a lot of money. And the recession, you know, being the recession with it, didn't they help invested with the in stock some really market. risky stuff, oh, and then the market went down. Where it shouldn't so, have went. So. But what's, it's a tough position because there's people that are running for the legislation that would like to see that retirement system taken over by the state treasury. Mm hmm I don't know that that's a wise choice. I don't know that it isn't. But the legislators for years have been trying to get their fingers on that money. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know why. I mean, the booster coffer, I don't know. Yeah. But I'm not sure that that's the way we need to go. Okay. And the state putting more of the burden on the counties and cities and everything, they're trying to get away from it mm -hmm. and trying to recover. And which was genius on their part because they're saying here it's your problem. Yeah. And I just don't know the best solution right now. Yeah. I really don't. It's a tough one. So um, yeah. So I got I, I I call it the Ken Bennett plan. <laughs> where, exactly. Where, you know where uh, <laughs> and he did a really nice presentation and I'm mm -hmm. hoping that he's going to come to Highway 69. Steve Irwin, if you're listening, Ken Bennett. Let um, me know. I'll be yeah. there. Yeah. He. Uh, he made a nice presentation at the Yavapai County Republican Women about how you know a half a billion dollars is going to Wall Street yeah. through through the committee, the PSPRS committee, and the treasurer actually has a higher return, and I think they spent like twenty million dollars last year. So you got yeah. a half a billion with a B versus twenty million with a higher return. You know something could happen, but um, you know it's an interesting. It is, and I don't. I don't know. You know the particulars. Know. Uh, that would not take a constitution amendment to change that. No. You know, if we go into changing the the system itself, then that that then absolutely would. You would have to have a constitutional yes. amendment, right? But to switch it over to the treasury, no. But I think we both, and you and I, would both agree that it's broken. Something needs. Oh, to be it's done. horrible. The system's horrible right now, and it can't it can't sustain like it is. Well, well, we talk about tax money, uh, Wiley. You know, recently the county increased our taxes. They did eighteen <laughs> percent on a hundred thousand dollars. I always like to bring it in the hundred thousand dollars because it's not a straight out eighteen percent. Every hundred thousand dollars, your home or property value is increased eighteen percent, which is still a, quite a whop. It is half of that money is going to pay off the liability for PSPRS at the county level. So my point is we're all paying for PSPRS somewhere. Absolutely. Right? In probably more ways than we know. And probably more. And the state is considering raising a half a cent or a penny sales tax mm -hmm. to pay for PSPRS. The city of Prescott raised the tax sales tax a 0.75 to pay for PSPRS. So we're all, you know, while I agree with all the municipalities that they're trying to bail themselves out on this broken system. They are. The bottom line is the system's broken. And and until it. we fix the system, are we ever going to get you know caught up? We may get caught up, but we're going to rapidly go right back down. Into but it. That's the thing. I don't know that we'll ever catch up because it's going to. The money's continually going out, and I think was it last year, year before, they switched it to they got to do twenty five years now to retire mm -hmm. instead of twenty trying to push it back farther but well, yeah. it's still going to snowball yeah they changed it to a tier three which mm -hmm. a lot of the guys are and that's an option and a lot of the guys are opting out of some of the some of the yeah. options on that as well so yeah that's that's a ball of snakes and we need to you know uh i think it the the real solution is going to come from the state level but being a, a board of supervisor representing the people again you know we need to get behind our representatives and say you know we need to fix it we do. Uh, and and my, my fear, and this is my personal fear, is as long as we just keep on adding taxes and going to the people for, as a big ATM, exactly, we are never going to fix it because the board's going to say, why do we need to do anything? Let's just tax the folks a little bit more. And that's what happens. And yeah. then that creates other problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, a higher tax burden on people that are struggling already. I mean, it just keeps going and going and going. Well, so, you, it's an interesting thing that you should say that because a lot of the community, especially here, mm -hmm. and I'm sure over in District 2, are retired people. We have a limited amount of income. We're living on pensions, what have you. Now, you and I, if we got taxed a little bit more, you know, that we'll probably still be able to go out to dinner or go over to Olive Garden or what have you. But there's a lot of people that can't do that. No. They're living, I mean, literally right down to the penny week by week. And the more we increase the taxes, it becomes more of a burden on our society. And it also takes money out of our economic system because they can't afford to go to Olive Garden or, you know, uh, get out and, and enjoy some of our um, great area restaurants and, and entertainment. Absolutely. And that's a huge impact on the community. Right. You know, they had a thing yesterday, the other day we were talking, um, apparently there was like 2,000 properties being sold on the courthouse 
for uh, delinquent taxes. Taxes, yes. You know, how far would that, you know, just would that snowball as we keep on going mm -hmm. down the, the, and it, that wormhole? And it doesn't. County, state, federal, it doesn't matter who. Can't keep going back to the people and tax them. Yeah. Just because they can't manage funds. And that's all it is, is mismanagement. You and I mismanage our bank accounts. We, we can't just do it out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they no don't tax. see it that Nobody's way. going to donate to me saying, bail me out no, now, right? No. So, yeah. they, I mean, they've got to yeah. quit doing that. Yeah. Um, the other side of that tax is going to infrastructure and the jail. Yes. Uh, as far as the jail goes, what are your thoughts on making it or building a new jail over here in Prescott? I haven't really looked into it a lot to see what mm -hmm. their census is in the jail, see if they're overcrowded. If they're not overcrowded, then it's not needed. Mm -hmm. And you know, I understand they're going to have a mental health facility and right. such as that in it, which is good. Mm -hmm. that, that does need to be provided to these people. But if they're going to build it, I'd heard one time, you know, because the feds state, they'll rent out beds. Mm -hmm. they'll, put, they'll populate a jail. And if they're building it for that reason, that's the wrong reason. Right. You know, we're not in the rental business. But if they're overcrowded, then fine, it's needed. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think they might need to take a step back and look at their sentencing guidelines. The what? I'm the sorry. sentencing guidelines? Yes. Oh, you like know? judicial reform? Yeah. I mean, look at minor crimes and what they're being sentenced for. Or, you know, maybe probation or do something different where we're not putting as many in jail. Well, it seems like, you know, uh, the state, and, I, and I'm regurgitating what I hear, so <laughs> I'm not going to say I know all this about, about this, but it sounds like we do incarcerate a lot of people in Arizona. We do. And, um, you know, and we're housing them. I, there's got to be a better way of, one, saving the taxpayers money to, than doing this, because $100 a day or $110 a day to put somebody in, in, in our, uh, our system, so in the jail. Exactly. So um, there's got to be a different way, you know. The, the, I can see, you know, on Whiskey Row on a Saturday night, a couple guys get into it, and, you know, and they both get arrested, and away they go downtown, you know, over to the Verde, uh, get booked in, and now they're inmates until somebody comes up and bails them out, correct? Exactly. So maybe well, there's a different way that we could take some of these low-end offenders that, you know, possibly, um, you know, got into a bar fight and let them get, book them, process them, let them go and have a court date where they need to come back. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, they're never going to come back without a bail. Well, you know, having a bench warrant out for you is no fun thing. They will come back. They will come back or they will be picked up somewhere along the line, even a speeding ticket, right? Exactly. When we pull somebody over. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, you know. When and you, officers do have the option of sight and release. Right. They can do that. Uh -huh. Most choose not to because generally there'll be problems afterwards. Right. And you're dealing with them again. Right. So they will book them in. Mm -hmm. But they just need to look at their sentencing guidelines, maybe restructure them, change them. I don't know. But yeah. Something's got to be done with well, that. Well, I'm certainly not advocating letting people go, you know, oh, no. or, or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. I don't want no. people going, oh, well, this guy's soft on crime. No, not at all. No, not even but close. I'm just saying that maybe we need to take a look at our processing system and see if we can't streamline it and maybe make some, some changes. But there's Because on the flip side of that, I will tell you, um, I went to the Capitol and spoke before a judicial committee mm -hmm. on, a, on, on a, um, a mandatory sentence for fentanyl dealers, people okay. who are out selling fentanyl for profit, yeah. you know, um, to slap their hand and give them a, a year uh, incarceration or probation. If you're selling deadly drugs on our street, you, you should to go, go to prison. jail for at least five years. That's my take. Straight to state And quite prison. honestly, that was what the bill said, and I could even increase that in my own world, but the bill was calling for a five-year minimum sentence, and I think that's absolutely necessary And it anymore. should be 100%, not 80% yeah. of their time. Right. It should be 100% yeah. you're there for five years. And I'm not talking about the guy who's addicted and, and, and is selling a drug to... to to supply his own habit. I'm talking about, like we just saw, I saw something in the paper today where a guy was arrested for 36 uh, M30s or f fentanyl yes. uh, pills. You know, this guy's out there selling that stuff. Oh, absolutely. So he needs he needs to pay the consequences. And it's a deadly drug. It's 
killing people all well, it's over. It's not like the old days, you know, and we can speak to the old days, I think. <laughs> you and I can. We've, we've we got the, the same, we're getting the same hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, um, you know, in our day, uh, Wiley, you would try marijuana and it would be, um, it wouldn't be a death sentence. No. And, but today they try these, these mimic pills and it's like playing Russian roulette. Did you get a good one or a bad one? Oh, and, absolutely. I mean, we just had, what, a couple days ago, two kids in, in, um, in Prescott Valley that they found unresponsive and unconscious in the backseat of a car, and they had to administer Narcan mm -hmm. and actually revive them and get them to the hospital where they, where they did survive, thank goodness. But you know what? If nobody would have reported that, yeah, they wouldn't have survived. Yeah, it would have been deadly consequences. And it's sad that societies came to a point where you have to carry Narcan with you. Yeah. And you, you know, know what? It's funny you should say that because I carry Narcan everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. I've got it in my glove compartment. Yeah. Yeah, I've been going to put some in mine and I haven't yet, but I'm going to because yeah. Yeah. you just never know. And yeah. it could be a family member. I mean, right. it might not be a stranger and it could be a family right. member you have no idea about. All right. So everybody... And Narcan training's out there. Uh, we do a lot of Narcan training. It's, uh, it's something that, um, you know, you can administer Narcan and there's no reverse effects unless that person is actually on an opiate. Yes. So if I find you passed out and for some whatever other reason and I administer Narcan, it's not going to affect you one way or another unless you are out on an opiate, then it will bring you around and bring your bring respiration you up. So Otherwise it doesn't. It doesn't, do, it doesn't affect you. No, it's... And there's good SAM laws that, uh, that will cover you as well for yes. this. So. <clears throat> so while we're on the subject of drugs, <laughs> oh. you know, there's a lot of talk going on about uh, recreational marijuana. Now, it is legal in Arizona for medical, medical marijuana yes. with a med medical marijuana card. Uh, how, what's your feeling about uh, opening it up and allowing people to uh, buy marijuana like they would a six pack of beer, if you will, you know, be 21 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, use marijuana within their within their home or out and out and about at uh, well, Colorado. And I say this, they have bud bars they do. where people can go in and smoke marijuana, like going in and having a beer. They smoke marijuana and they get in their car and drive home. It's a pretty crazy world. But, you know, it is. Who am I to say? <laughs> well, they're still under the influence. Right. And. I, you know, I don't know because people that are going to do it recreationally, most of them, are going to go get a health card, medical card anyway. They can find a doctor. They got signs on every corner in Phoenix mm -hmm. that'll give them a card. Mm -hmm. So they're going to do it anyway. So my thought is it's already happening. Mm -hmm. Figure out how to regulate it, tax it, and make it legal. Okay. You know, but figure out because the DUI laws are going to be they're fighting it right now trying to figure out what to do with it with the medical cards because well, that's it stays hard because in your THC system. is you know you can detect mm -hmm. it in your blood but For the levels kind of aren't the same like alcohol you know when you get over a point oh eight you know that there's probably yeah they're, some talk, yeah, they're it. impaired but and you could have T THC in your system up to three four days after use mm -hmm. so you may not be showing any uh, um, a physical impairment, but it's still within your system. Is there also, and we just don't know. I don't, you know, no, I don't have the, the answer to that. Is. Maybe somebody does out there. If you do, write a comment. But um, I don't think they've come up with a way of judging the levels for impairment. Mm -hmm. They may have, and I haven't heard about it yet. Right. But that's where the problem is going to be yeah. because I don't know. That's just going to be hard prove right yeah, well you know it, it's interesting that you know in Colorado and we do have different areas that are what I call petri dishes if you will uh -huh. and um, their their uh, collision rate has gone up and there's been a lot more THC related collisions within the community well there has to be yeah quite honestly I mean if you're gonna put uh, uh, recreational marijuana on the corners like the liquor department li liquor stores we have that with liquor with alcohol. Oh, absolutely. If you're going to do the same thing with, with uh, marijuana, you're going to have the same uh, effect, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, it's just, I, everybody has their own opinion. I have mine, you have yours, but, you know, I just, I don't know if opening Pandora's box sometimes is really the smart thing it, to do. But to your point, I know that the, if, you know, there's a lot of people out there, if they're going to use it, they're going to use it anyway. They so. are, and they're going to go around the system. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely going to go around it. They're going to have their medical card. 
I know people that do it yeah. and have their medical card. Yeah. And there really isn't anything medically wrong with them. Yeah. But you can circumvent the system, go around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a fan of it, but yeah. I just might as well yeah. <laughs> tax it and make some money. Make some money on it. That's huh? what's going to happen anyway. Um, let's talk about traffic and, and growth. Oh. I mean, our, our county's like on fire, right? Well, it's horrible and traffic. It's, and, it's, and it's getting worse. And um, uh, what are some of your solutions as far as, um, you know, we can't tell people not to move here, obviously. No. But um, are there any solutions that you see that uh, we, could, we could do to help at least get the flow of traffic going a little bit better or our infrastructure? Yeah, we need to... Well, need to work with the state and get 169 improved. Mm -hmm. That needs four lane because the traffic on 169 is horrible. Mm -hmm. Traffic coming here today, I completely underestimated it. Now you're was coming almost from lost. Cor Cornville, from right? Cornville, yeah. So you, yeah, you got the. We were almost the late, <laughs> <laughs> but we live probably about a hundred yards off the Cornville Road. Yeah, I hear traffic all day, all night, and that's one of the things that Verde Connect they're talking about doing is to divert some of that traffic. Well, mm -hmm. I don't think it's gonna help. So we need to go in to like Cornville Road, mm -hmm. widen it, get it up to specs, and try to move the traffic a little better, put some traffic control devices in, and I hate to say it, but probably roundabouts, mm -hmm. so we can move the traffic better and just improve what we have. I mean, I don't see building other roads right now. I can't think of anywhere where that would benefit us at all and it's like the that one they're wanting to put across from 260 to beaverhead it would benefit probably a quarter of cottonwood mm -hmm. because anybody from if you're familiar with cottonwood where 260 and 89 meet to clarkdale jerome all that they're going to come down cornville road if they're going that way it's the closest route the trucks hauling out of Phoenix Cement, if they're going north, they come down Cornville Road. Mm -hmm. They're not going to go down 260 and cut across. Mm -hmm. So take that money, $10, $20 million, whatever they have set aside, and put it in Cornville Road. Get it up to standards. Put turn lanes in. Put traffic control devices. And then look at other roads we can invest in or widen. Maybe make part of Cornville Road four lane from Cornville to 17 mm -hmm. so we can move traffic better. But I think that's what we need to focus on more than adding roads. Because mm -hmm. we were at a meeting a couple weeks ago and the road superintendent was there and he's lost $4 million out of his budget. And he's got, I think he said a $20 million budget. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see where that 4 million went, see if we can't put it back, maybe add to it and be able to do the things they need to do. Because they have a tremendous amount of dirt roads. Yeah that they need to take care of, that probably isn't getting taken care of as they should. And that's gonna be the major thing, is just building on what we have. Where would you, where would you get the money? We were ta just talking about taxes. Do you think that's within the budget to do this? Or would you, would you support, like, you know, our representative, Noel Campbell, mm -hmm. was in front of a gas tax. Would you support another tax of no. some sort to, to create this? I'm not going to support any tax right now. Mm -hmm. No tax increases at all. I'd vote no on all of them. Would you have supported the 18% tax? No. Why they? Absolutely would... not. Yeah. Because my feeling is if, if you want to do something, if you, capital improvements, mm -hmm. plan ahead. Plan out 10, 15, 20 years from now and say, okay, we're going to take half a percent of our budget a year, set it aside into a capital improvement fund. And in this amount of time, we'll actually have the cash to just pay for it mm -hmm. and do it that way and quit fleecing the people of Yavapai County for money. But I wouldn't vote for any tax increase at all. What do you see as probably one of the more uh, needed uh, uh, whether it's infrastructure or otherwise, something that would be needed within your immediate community in District 2? I think it's 100% just infrastructure, mm -hmm. getting the roads up to where they should be. It's like they built Beaverhead Flat Road. They paved it some years ago, quite a few years ago. And it wasn't designed for the amount of traffic it has. The road's coming apart already. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Cornville Road from 89A to Cornville. They redid it several years ago. 
but it wasn't designed for the traffic flow it has or the heavy trucks. It's coming apart. And those need to be addressed pretty much immediately mm -hmm. before they just get in such bad And those shape. would be some of your t first targeted they would things be, that yes, you would want to do? Absolutely. And another one would be developmental services everywhere I go. That seems to be the biggest complaint of anybody mm -hmm. is how they're conducting themselves. So we'd need to look at maybe changing some regulations, adding some people to it so you know people can get service quicker. Mm -hmm. We would have to really look at that. When you talk about that, is that like the work permits and, yes. and that kind of stuff? Because I know uh, just some of my friends here in uh, the Prescott area, not the city of, but in the, in the county, mm -hmm. to try to get a work uh, a building permit is quite a feat. I mean, there's a lot that's put into it. Then you wait and you wait. And some of the guys, again, that I know who do, who do jobs um, try to schedule other jobs while they're waiting for this permit they're trying to do this job mm -hmm. because it is a slow process and it what is. bothers me the most Wiley for me again and that I should say for me but through them what their concern is these permits have gone up they increase oh, the price of permits and the reason and I, it, you know it's interesting the justification sometimes for increases as I understand it because why should the citizens of Yavapai County pay for your work, for your permit, mm -hmm. that's going to have inspectors come out and all that stuff. You need to pay for your own permit because you're taxing that system. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all well and good, but you know what? My taxes didn't go down. I'm paying more for work permits. Exactly. That money that they're, that they're bringing in for work permits that they're saving out of the general fund was never returned to the citizens of Yavapai. So you and see... There's, there's all kinds of little ways that we, you know, it's oh, yeah. like looking at your phone bill, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you got this list of taxes for all this stuff. And mm -hmm. I see the same thing happening with the building permits oh, and, and the development. And actually, developmental services was real instrumental in me deciding to run. Mm -hmm. I went in, uh, I was helping my cousin. He does gas stations. And I was helping him in Rudy Village working on one. And... He asked me to go by and see if we needed an electrical permit because mm -hmm. the state fire marshal has 100% jurisdiction over anything he does. Mm -hmm. Local governments don't. So I went in, told them, okay, we're going to unscrew the wire nuts, lift the dispensers off, set the new ones on, screw them back together. Do we need a permit? Nope. Okay. So I left, told him, yeah, they said no. He goes, would you get it in writing? I said, no. He goes, well, go back and get it in writing. I said, okay. So I went back and I said, you know, if you would, write it on a napkin, whatever you want, but yeah. I need it in writing. So this gentleman goes, well, you know, you need one. I uh. said, you're kidding me. I said, you do understand what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah. he goes, you need one. Yeah. So I had to go do a site plan and everything come back. It was, 100, it was over $100, like $108, $110 right. for this permit. And he goes, now you do know that we require two inspections. I said, to look at what? You're going to send the guy out there twice to look at what? There's nothing to look at. Yeah, yeah, we require two inspections. That's fine. Yeah. We never called them for the inspections because they had no jurisdiction. But the permit actually says remove and replace wire nuts. Hmm. I still I have a picture of it. Yeah, picture. And when I'm elected mm -hmm. and sworn in, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to the head of developmental services, and I'm going to see if he can go back. And just look at permits. Right. Not that one specifically, but just look at permits that Overall. people were made to take out that they shouldn't have. And I, to be clear, you know, I want to make sure that somebody who works in that department, we're not bagging on no, you. No, not at we're all. Not at all. You guys do a great job in, for what I think there just needs some. Uh, and it starts with the board. It quite does. Honestly, it starts with the board, and then it goes to the department heads and, and makes some changes that were more friendly for the community. So um, I, I don't want you guys, because I've gone through there and oh. I've been treated with, I mean, these people are the nicest people in the world. Oh, they are. It's the system, you know, <laughs> kind of like the FBI, you know, it's like <laughs> the FBI agents, man, you guys are awesome. But you know, when you get to the upper level, then exactly. that's where the... And like where I the, said, I mean, they need to look at maybe taking some regulations out, right. streamlining some things, mm -hmm. adding some people if they can, you know, mm -hmm. We can look for money to add people right. to put in their budget because I'm sure they're short-staffed. Everybody's short-staffed. Yeah. Yeah. But 
it just if needs to be a little. If you're not short-staffed, there's something wrong. Exactly. Quite honestly. Yeah. And, you know, that'll take to where they're not so long with their permits, mm -hmm. lighten their load, as it should be. So um, we're kind of coming towards the end. I don't have very many more questions for you. <laughs> but, you know, um, no, I, I appreciate <laughs> you coming here because, like I said, I, you know, I don't really get a whole lot of, for me, I'm mm -hmm. more in this area, and I wanted to get you here to represent the people in District 2 because, you know, you've got a large community out there as well. And I would love to have you come back and speak. Uh, as the campaign comes goes forward about anything that you see that you know you might want to uh, connect with the folks mm -hmm. for your voter base um, you're more than welcome as well, thank uh, you so uh, and it's a long drive I get it but you know oh, what? it's not, it's not bad. too bad and I greatly appreciate you having me over yeah well I, I'm glad you did and so where can the folks see you next time are you uh, speaking in any events that might uh, bring interest to the people? I will be at the Pachyderm Coalition meeting tomorrow at Prescott Country Club. I don't have the address with me. Mm -hmm. That starts at 1030 to 2. Okay. And I believe Daniel McCarthy will be there and a couple other folks will be there. Okay. And then my next engagement is... Looking at, looking at the campaign manager. <laughs> yeah, my campaign manager. Plowhead. Oh. Plowing Ahead Ranch in Camp Verde on March 8th at 1. Okay. We'll be there. Okay. And the folks, you know, we'll, we'll try to get those websites. Yeah, I'll have it on my website and also my Facebook page. And again, if you want to contact uh, Wiley and, and ask him any questions, he's both on the web and he's also on Facebook. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find, you know, if the, uh, where he's speaking. Um, I found you interesting at Highway 69. I thought, <laughs> man, I got to get this guy on the show, you know. Well, uh, thank you. Because it was, uh, it, it's, it's always good to hear the candidates so that, you know, this whole show is revolved around making sure people have the opportunity to have uh, an informed decision in the voter booth. Absolutely. You know? And that's so, the most important thing is right. get out and vote, whether it's for me or somebody else, just get out and vote. Yeah, because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's our duty. And, oh, absolutely. And to... Uh, and again, to be informed mm -hmm. and I know where your candidate stands. So I'm sure you'll probably be at the next Highway 69 uh, Republican. I have, I don't have the date on that either, but we meet say months the a 11th, month. Or the 11th was the last one, but I wanted yeah. to say it's March 11th, but it's somewhere. Right? Somewhere in the it's early the part of March. Tuesday of March. And I'll, I'll make sure that I, I throw that out there as time and gets closer. Um, that'll be on my website. And also there's tabs where you can contact me, uh, Donate if you'd like to donate to the yeah. campaign. Yeah, it takes money to do this. Man. It does take money. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I was I was somewhat surprised. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it is. It does take money, and it takes dedication. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I say thank you, and I know a lot of people who stand behind me say thank you to you guys, the candidates. Win, lose, or draw. These people put themselves out in front of the community because they want to serve their community and Absolutely. make their community better. And just like you said. You can either sit at the computer and, you know, bitch. That's what or I was going to use. Or you can get up and come out and, you know, get off the computer and come out and make a difference. And do something. So, and, and do something. Whether that's going to your local governments and just talking to them. Right. Or writing a letter to them or whatever. Just do something to I try agree. to help and make things better for everybody. Right. Go, go to before the board. Speak before the board. If you're in the city, speak before the council. Absolutely. Prescott Valley, Prescott, you know, wherever. Um, it takes that engagement to make things happen. And whoever it is, they're more than happy to have you come talk to them. I, I, I believe that. They, they're absolutely And they may not receptive. agree with you. And you know what? Even some of the people I talk to, I may not agree with them on some just issues. Jack Smith, for example. And exactly. Jack and I, I really do appreciate Jack. He was a good guy. Mm -hmm. He still is a good guy. And, uh, you know, I agreed on some of the stuff that he did and on some of the things he didn't. But he was always willing to sit down and talk to me about it. Oh, yeah. And that was, you know what? What more can you ask about from a representative, right? Mm -hmm. And so. I absolutely promise I will not make everybody happy. You can't. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. yeah. But I'll do the best I can. There you go. You know, that's all I can do. All right. Well, thank you, Wiley. And you thank know what? You, I'm going to say that is your camera over here. You <laughs> okay. take a look at that. The people are watching you and tell them why they should go vote for Wiley Klein, Board of Supervisors, District 2. Take it away. You'll have a good voice for your district. I'll be accessible. I'll do anything I can for everybody in Yavapai County, not just my district.
but we have got to start taking the taxes and cutting them back and being a lot more responsible with our money. And that's what I'm here for. And thank you all. I hope you vote for me. Good deal. Great. Thanks Wayne, again. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Prescott, there you have it. And District 2 in Cornville and all points <laughs> in between. You know what? We really need to expand our horizons. I was talking to some of the editors here. I want to get some more people from the Prescott Valley area, Dewey area. Uh -huh. Chino, if you're listening, uh, I want to get some folks in Chino because, you know, we, this is our community. It's just not Prescott. It's, it's a whole area. It is. So speaking of our area, I'm glad you brought that up, Wiley. Because on Saturday, tomorrow, the Oath Keepers, who meet at the First Southern Baptist Church, that's at 1524 North State Route 89, Building C in uh, Chino Valley. Okay. Uh, Selena Bliss, who is the candidate for uh, LD1, uh, the State House, okay. will be speaking. And um, then after she speaks, they're going to go into some information about uh, the coronavirus and, and give the community a little bit more of an update nationwide and worldwide what's going on as mm -hmm. far as the coronavirus and what kind of threat assessment that is to us uh, here in our city. Also, um, so this all starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, usually runs from 2 to 4. And Oath Keepers is a preparedness team. It's, you mm -hmm. know, we prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And um, you learn all kinds of stuff from them. Uh, I'm part of the medical team. Uh, you have home medicine, you have uh, engineering, you have radios, so, you know, we all are ham operators. They'll help you get your ham license mm -hmm. so that you're always in communications if the cell phone towers go down for whatever reason. Absolutely. So, um, you know what, come out and check them out. Two o'clock, it's free, absolutely free. And something you might want to put on your calendar on May 9th in Oath Keepers, we are going to have another one of our Stop the Bleed classes. And Stop the Bleed is, it, it, this is a certified class. We okay. are under the Association of, of Surgeons. And um, what we do is we teach you emergency trauma uh, medicine, if you will. Okay. You're, if you are hurt, you know, God forbid, a gunshot or even a car accident, you know, how many mm -hmm. times do we roll up... Uh, uh, as law enforcement, yeah. you know, you're two, three minutes away, somebody's bleeding bad. It's the people that are on the scene. They are really the first responders. They are, absolutely. And that's who we're training you. We're training you how to be a first responder, of knowing how to put a tourniquet on, mm -hmm. how to pack a, 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 a bleed, stop an arterial bleed out. We bleed out in about three and a half minutes, mm -hmm. uh, a normal size, uh, like you and I, men. Um, so it's important that we know how to stop that if we ever should roll up on something, you know, God forbid, again, a shooting, a car accident, a backyard accident. I know guys that carry tourniquets <coughs> in, their, in their chainsaw bags, you know, when they go out and cut wood, firewood. Which is a good idea. Good, I mean, darn good idea. a lot of saw accidents. So again, Stop the Bleed on May 9th. You might want to put May that on your calendar. Again, this is absolutely free. It's just to inform the public how to do it. We feel that there's more people that know how to do this stuff, the better off we would be mm -hmm. in a case of an emergency. So with that, I just want to say thank you all. Um, I will be on again at noon. Mary Mallory, District 5 Supervisor, will be here. And we're going to uh, pretty much ask her the same questions, probably. <laughs> Good and, luck. And uh, just have a chat. And, um, and we'll see you at noon. In the meantime, I want to say always thank you to our military and police, past and present serving. Yes. Without you, we would not have the opportunity to sit here and discuss at our table our community and what's going on. Also, our, our, our police and fire guys and gals that keep our streets Absolutely. safe, we always say thank you very much. And we've got your back, and we appreciate the job that you're doing. So with that, Willie, good luck, brother. Thank you, sir. Take care. We'll see you at noon, guys, gals. <laughs>